start. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. For the last time, I would like to welcome you from Medical Care Service for Refugees Bochum, a social medical human rights organization and psychosocial treatment center for survivors of torture and war. My name is Bianca Schmolzer, and I am responsible for human rights advocacy projects in our organization, focusing on refugees' rights and the rights of survivors of crimes against humanity to truth, justice, and integral reparation. With Medico International and the Institute for the International Law of Peace and Armed Conflict, IFHV, we found two excellent cooperation partners in which to realize this digital series of lectures on the occasion of the, of the 70th anniversary of the UN Refugee Convention. First of all, I would like to thank all 23 international experts that participated in these nine sessions of our series of lectures, where we discussed intensely various aspects and obstacles in international refugee protection. And I want to thank all speakers of today <clears throat> for doing also this final session with us, where we want to discuss about current and future challenges of refugee protection. I would also like to thank the Foundation for Environment and Development, North Rhine-Westphalia, and Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for funding this project that is now coming to an end. Before we start, let me introduce my colleague, Benedikt Behlert from IFHB. Hello, everyone. Um, great to be here uh, with all of you and very much looking forward to this to the discussion. My name is Benedikt Behlert. I am a PhD student in international human rights law and a research associate at the EFFH in Bochum, um, which is one of the largest academic institutes focusing on international law, humanitarian crises and humanitarian assistance. And for some years now, we've also had a pretty strong emphasis um, on international refugee law um, and refugee protection, uh, in particular with um, a PhD college, a micro college on forced migration uh, funded by uh, the Tokyo Foundation uh, in Japan. Um, as I said, I'm very much, I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, before we continue with um, our substantial discussions, um, I have a couple of technical points for everyone attending the webinar today. Um, we are very much looking forward not only to what our panelists have to say, but also to questions from the audience and comments from the audience. And we encourage everyone to post them in the Q&A section of this webinar. Um, given that we have a very tight schedule, we cannot promise that we will be able to raise all the questions with our experts on the panels, uh, but we will do our best um, to um, throw in um, as many of them as possible. Um, because this meeting is being recorded, we will, uh, re we will um, repeat the questions or we will read out the questions without the names of those persons um, asking the questions. So you can be free, you can be open, whatever you want to know, please, please post it in the Q&A section. After an intense analysis of the history and the current state of international refugee protection throughout our series of lectures, this last session will be a discussion on future challenges and what is needed to strengthen refugees' rights and to establish worldwide solidarity instead of building walls and fortresses that intend to exclude human beings that seek international protection and support. We are happy and very thankful to, to discuss today with Jeff, Jeff Crisp, Research Associate of the Refugees Study Center of Oxford University, with Orub El Abed from the Center for Lebanese Studies from the Lebanese Amer American University in Beirut, with Mokhtar Danyaye from the NGO Alarm from Sahara, with Shirin Tinizan from the NGO Wadi, and Jay Marie Ruhunwa from the NGO Dignity Kwanzaa in Tanzania. In the frame of our series of lectures, there have been some central questions, reflections and ideas that could improve international refugee protection and that we would like to discuss more in detail with you and also with you in the audience. Yeah, thank you very much for the um, overall introduction, Bianca. The first topic um, that we would like to discuss with you today um, is new or modern day drivers of forced migration 
and how to accommodate them in the international system of refugee protection. In the previous sessions of this discussion series, one recurring theme was that large parts of today's forced migratory movements are caused by drivers that are not recognized by the 1951 convention. Examples would be the adverse effects of climate change or extreme poverty. And given that the 1951 convention is still the central legal instrument for refugee protection, this poses an obvious challenge for the years ahead. So we would like to ask you, how can we accommodate new drivers of forced migration, which are not currently recognized by the convention? Do we need new categories that we need to think in when thinking about forced migration? Do we need open-ended terms like mixed migration? And how could we accommodate those legally and institutionally? It's up to you who wants to start <laughs> with our first question. So perhaps, uh, Jeff, what about you? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, hello to everybody. Great to be with you this afternoon or whatever time it is in your time zone. Let me just uh, start with a few words about the Refugee Convention. The Refugee Convention is often described by politicians and other commentators as being outdated, um, being out of touch with current realities, something that was based in the post-war area and is no longer relevant to contemporary times. And I would uh, take a very different view from that opinion. I think the Refugee Convention has actually proved to be a remarkably flexible legal instrument in the sense that the Refugee Convention established in 1951 has been progressively extended to groups of people that were perhaps not envisaged at the time that the convention was drafted. For example, victims of domestic violence, people persecuted on the grounds of their sexual orientation, gender, uh, forcibly conscripted children, and most notably people affected by generalized armed conflict. So while I don't always agree with UNHCR, I do concur with the organization in their position that there are serious risks in opening up a discussion on the refugee definition and seeking to expand it formally. Uh, I think that in fact, if we were to open that up for discussion, it's almost certain that states would try to impose a more restricted definition of refugee, which would actually exclude large numbers of people from the ability to seek asylum. So in terms of the question that uh, Benedict posed, I would say we need to look for alternative protection approaches and frameworks for other groups of people who might not have been envisaged at the time of 1951. A good example would be the Platform for Disaster Displacement and its agenda for protection for displaced people as a result of climate change. I think this approach is going to be more successful and more acceptable than one which seeks to uh, establish uh, a new formal definition of refugees uh, alternative to the one uh, specified in the 1951 convention. In terms of definitions, let me make three additional points, and I'd be very interested to hear anybody's comments on these. Firstly, you might have noticed that UNHCR has progressively stopped using the word refugee and now increasingly talks about forcibly displaced people or people forced to flee. And it's not particularly surprising why it's done that. It's because it can say that there are around 86 million people around the world who are forcibly displaced, whereas the number of refugees is only around, under its mandate, there is only around 20 million. So in terms of its own visibility and importance and significance, it makes a lot of sense for UNHCR to talk about uh, people forced to flee or forcibly displaced people rather than refugees. And I think this is a little bit of a dangerous uh, approach. I think we should retain the specificity of refugee, people being outside of their country of origin and unable to return to it as a result of a well-founded fear of persecution. Uh, my second point is that increasingly in the humanitarian world, we are taking displacement as a kind of a proxy for suffering. And I'm not sure that this is actually the right approach. I think there are many people who are actually unable or unwilling to move 
who are in just as bad, if not even worse situation than refugees or internally displaced people. And I think uh, too much of the discourse on displacement concentrates on those people who have been forced to flee and doesn't focus <clears throat> sufficiently on people who are trapped in situations of severe crisis. Um, and then my third uh, point on definitions would be another point raised by Benedict, that is the notion of mixed migration. The notion of mixed migration was developed in the early 1990s in response to a situation where refugees were increasingly moving alongside other people using the same routes, the same means of transport, often using the services of the same human smugglers and going from the same country of origin to the same country of destination. And I think in that context, it was quite a useful concept. I would like to kind of raise the question, and I'd be interested for any thoughts on this. Perhaps mixed migration has become just too all-encompassing and too general a concept. It's now applied to almost any human movement that takes place anywhere in the world. I think it's lost its specificity. And we might want to ask whether it's actually in terms of the nationalities of people, in terms of their gender, in terms of their age, in terms of their motivations and intentions and long term aspirations. So I would just like to kind of pose that question. Has the notion of mixed migration, which might have been of some use when it was first established, has it become a little bit too over, overall, too encompassing, and perhaps lacking in any kind of analytical specificity? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. So very, very interesting beginning. <laughs> so who has, uh, yeah, Uruf? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, Jeff. Um, I cannot uh, disagree completely with what you said. Absolutely. I would really refrain from using the word mixed migration. Uh, we can see it, by the way, from two perspectives. One perspective that is really, as Jeff said, it's it just it can encompass everything. But what do you mean by mixed migration? Remember, I can be a refugee, then I can become a labor worker, then I can become uh, a, a criminal uh, migrant when I when I go to a smuggler who gets me to go from Jordan or Turkey to to Greece. So what do we mean? So it's there's there's this very little nuance uh, in the word mixed migration. But just to answer the question the, the question that was raised by Benedict, I would I was just saying like, do we really need to go for new categories? Or do we really need the, the UNHCR to take care of those existing categories that is not being, that is, uh, there's not enough attention that's being given to all these groups in the right way with the word protection, with a very much of an emphasis on the word protection. On my list, um, at the global, the, the way I see it, and I don't want to go into the, the definition of UNHCR or of the, of the convention, but remember, we are talking about the, the taking into consideration the five grounds of race, religion, nationality, and the political opinion, people with political opinion, and the social groups, the, the, the particular, the people with particular social groups. So this is the grounds. And uh, is really the, the, the convention, is it able really to address all the needs of these people? One point. The second element is we're so aware also within the mandate of the UNHCR that was drawn uh, out of the 1951 convention is the following. We have something called the development induced uh, displacement that are also considered as refugees. We have the climate change, the climate, uh, the people who are caused by uh, due to climate uh, as refugees. And the third group, which is the internally displaced that are also considered within that, uh, that bigger uh, apparatus. Added to that, and here I'm, I'm just taking you, I'm zooming in a little bit within my Middle East. Uh, we have, for example, the issue of the Palestinians Often it is said, and it, is, it has been very much of a stereotype response, is that, yeah, Palestinians are not also at all to be considered by the, the, by the convention. 
right. Uh, only those Palestinians within the five areas of UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Works Agency, are the only ones to be covered and addressed by UNRWA. But what about those who were in Iraq? What about those who are now coming out from Egypt and just being stranded everywhere in the world? What about those who are who are now leaving Syria and being elsewhere in the world? Who's really who are in Turkey? I was recently in Turkey, and who is really dealing with these people? So one of the points is that the, the convention did address the Palestinians in Article 1D. That was saying those people who do not fall under the attention of another UN body can really fall under the protection of the protection and the assistance of uh, of UNHCR so this is one very important element that until today unfortunately we continue to miss out on these palestinians another group that's also being missed out on the stateless in jordan where i am today we're having about 400,000, about uh, between 300 to 400,000 people who are from Gaza. They came from Gaza with this very in limbo status of, uh, of we call it provisional uh, passport document, pardon me, it's a, it's a laissez passer, it's a travel document, where they arrived in Jordan and they were never ever, since 1967, they were never ever taken to another position and they continue to live with, with their provisional status holding a Jordanian travel document that is renewable every two years with literally very little rights. These people are almost considered to be stateless. So what is really happening to them and who's to pay, to pay attention to them? We cannot keep remain, uh, keep uh, blaming the UNRWA uh, because we're within, within its area, but also I believe there is a role by this convention that, that should be very encompassing to take into consideration all these people who are, I call them uh, pendant in the air. Like we, we don't see where do we put them. We don't see where do we fit them in, any, in which whole. So what I think it's important, it's really worth considering rights where we're, we're calling for this protractedness. And here we're coming to an, another word, like the, the, the world has brought to us these protracted groups. Again, where I am in Jordan, where I am in the Middle East, we're talking about 70 years of, of Palestinians being in here. Today, we're talking about Syrians who've been here for the last 10 years, imagine, uh, as if it was yesterday. Now it's almost 10 years. Added, of course, to the Iraqis. We're in a region that has more than a region that has more than are you okay? Do you still hear me? So, uh, so we are now in a region with uh, with almost twelve million uh, internally displaced in one little region, the Levantine, and with a region of about six uh, six million refugees. Uh, again, stranded. We're not so sure uh, where to put them and which holes we need to put them. Um, so uh, definitely pushing for a better approach of protection rather than expanding the definition. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think this, uh, if no one of the other uh, panelists wants to say something on the first issue, then I think this is already a good moment um, to, oh, sorry, Shiri. <laughs> yeah, so I'm happy to chip in on this one. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. Sorry about my voice. Uh, I'll try to get through this as pain-free as possible. Uh, so in terms of uh, looking into the categories there are of refugees and whether they need to be expanded and the way that it looks now, it's obviously a useful debate. Um, but right now we also have a lot of people who do fall in under the categories listed under the Geneva Convention, which are not receiving protection. So in a way, I would kind of like to change the question in terms of what do we do with the people who are now covered by the Geneva Convention, but not receiving their protection that they should have. Um, from what I see, it's the Geneva Convention is a broken system and it's been questioned uh, since the 1950s by Hannah Arendt, for example. Um, so we're navigating in this broken system and we're just increasingly as time goes seeing how it's not really working in its ideal form. I mean, the law and its practice, it, it, it's widening the, um, between them. So there is a contradiction there. Uh, from what I see in terms of how the Geneva 
uh, convention should operate and how the nation state operates it, if I can place it like that. So one example that I have is the Yesidis. So Wadi, uh, we're a small organization, we work uh, in the Kurdish area in Iraq, uh, lots of Yazidi people. Yazidis are a people who are acknowledged by the UN uh, for genocide, and they're internally displaced people, meaning they are refugees, but they're refugees within their own country, not refugees in an international setting, meaning they don't get the international protection, which they would be entitled to. If a Yazidi can get themselves to Germany, they have 80% chance of getting asylum because they fit under the Geneva Convention criteria to get that asylum. But within Iraq, they're just a subject to the state. So it's getting more and more difficult to become a refugee, to, to get that legal benefit and the rights, which is indicated with being a refugee. Um, and even, I mean, we can look at countries who have signed the convention. Let's take Australia. That's a good example. They've signed lots of conventions. And what do they do? do they place a lot of asylum seekers in Papua New Guinea and the island. Uh, and then we can look at Iran, who have not signed so many conventions. Um, they, they don't consider the asylum seekers or the migrants inside their countries as asylum seekers. They haven't signed a convention. They don't see them as um, potential citizens and they're up for deportation, but still they have 2.5 million people inside Iran and a similar thing in Kenya with the Somali people. So yeah, we've signed the Geneva Convention, but, but how do we uh, uphold it? So even if we do expand with more categories, how do we continue to uphold it? Because right now we're not doing it, it's not viable. And the number of refugees is increasing every single day. We can expand the categories and we will get even higher numbers. And then what do we do? Whose responsibility is this? And where do we go from here? Those are, um, Shireen, thank you very much. Those are very, very important questions, obviously, and we will get to them um, in as we sort of go towards more concrete and more practical uh, questions uh, that, that we will discuss a bit later on. Um, Jane Mary, you also have um, a contribution to the first uh, question that we wanted yeah. to discuss. And after that, I would like to uh, take the opportunity to move on uh, to sort of our second step of, of analyzing the, the coming challenges. Yeah, mine is very quick. Uh, can you hear me? So mine is very quick, uh, as we're talking about uh, whether or not to expand the, the, the to, in, to increase the categories. I think um, uh, in the light of uh, uh, what Orum has uh, said and uh, Shreen as well, uh, when I was going through these questions, um, one question came to my mind and was, uh, what does uh, uh, the term refugee add in the life of a person who has fled? Because uh, at times uh, uh, in other places, just because um, uh, the protection system is just so broken, you are in a worse situation if you are recognized as a refugee vis-a-vis -vis other people who are living as just other types of migrants, whether documented or not documented. So if, if there are other ways that um, uh, um, people who are forced to flee can be uh, can receive protection without not necessarily adding them into a group of refugee, probably that would also be a, 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 a better alternative. So I just wanted to add that uh, when we're discussing this, it's not like a refugee has, of course in paper has all this set of, of, of rights, uh, but in practice it can be very uh, different to the extent that maybe it doesn't really make a lot of sense uh, insisting that people should be recognized as refugees. That's all. Uh, thank you very much, Jay Mary. Mokta, you also wanted to comment on this point? Yeah, thank you very briefly because I think those who precede me already uh, said many things that I was uh, thinking about, but um, 
just an example, uh, as uh, I think Shirin said, it's uh, like country which uh, signed and uh, the convention. And uh, within this uh, country, I will take, I, I, want, I just want to give an example of my country, Niger, which uh, receive maybe refugee and asylum seeker from Libya. And uh, within the country itself, there is a lot of people in displacement. If you take uh, the example of the west uh, side of the country, where you have more than 300,000 people displayed from um, uh, the border side with uh, uh, Mali because of uh, terrorism and other jihadist uh, attacks. And uh, east side of the country where uh, the attacks and the other um, threats of Boko Haram let a lot of villages move and leave their uh, uh, places. Sorry for the English, um, just uh, <laughs> to mention it also. So what is the well or the good um, thing to do regarding this? Because the country itself facing uh, the interior displacement, receiving other uh, refugees from Libya that maybe uh, UNHCR is taking care more than those who are in international from Libya. And uh, the, the ones that are a lot, are in uh, the country and they are citizens, but they should also be uh, protected. So for me to expand categories is not a good thing because we will get through a kind of uh, play of words. If I take like uh, the example of uh, uh, migration on which we're working. So we move from uh, clandestine migration to irregular migration to a migrant in irregular situation, but still the problem is, and uh, even the word itself migration, if you take it, it's only uh, those, uh, the poorest that are uh, moving toward the rich are considered migrants. An example, all the uh, Western people, European, if they come, whatever the way they use to come like uh, in a uh, global South, they won't be called migrants. And those in a global South, whatever, what, or what, how, what, whatever the situation or where, uh, whew, sorry for the English. Huh? <laughs> Whatever the way they, you, they take to be in the global north, they are considered as migrants. So for me, the words or categories is not a uh, solution for that, just to focus on a uh, human and the person, the one in need and the one who seek protection or the person that on mobility. This is the only point I want to mention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mokta. Um, we have already now raised a couple of points uh, around practical protection, more practical questions, implementation of standards, etc. Um, but for a couple of minutes more, I would like to stay um, with the regulatory framework within which international refugee protection, the protection of forced migrants um, takes place. Um, and one question that has come up um, in the past panels or on the past panels of this discussion series, um, or an observation rather, was that there is currently no um, political momentum for changing the hard law. Um, that we have, though, seen um, important initiatives um, in the realm of soft law, thinking, for example, about the global compact on refugees. Um, so we would like to discuss this development, this current development of the regulatory framework, broadly speaking with you um, a little bit and ask you why there is no political momentum for changing hard legal rules to perhaps not to uh, widen the refugee convention. I guess the consensus here was that that would not be a good thing, but perhaps to develop new instruments that would address more modern forms of uh, migration, forced migration adequately. Um, and whether that lack of political momentum is actually such a bad thing. We've also already touched on more 
um, creative, perhaps, if you will, ways to change the regulatory framework. And perhaps the way, the way via soft law is more promising or in the end more effective than trying to develop new hard law instruments or changing the old ones. So we would very much like to hear from you um, what you think would be the best way forward for developing the regulatory framework uh, within which refugee protection takes place nowadays. Jeff. Yeah, thanks very much. Great question. Um, I will try to be balanced on this question, although I've got some particular opinions, particularly on the Global Compact. Uh, and the Global Compact, I think there are some positive dimensions to the Compact. Certainly the Global Compact placed the issue of the mass movement of people at the very top of the global policy agenda. The fact that the General Assembly came together to discuss it and was able to formulate that document uh, was an important, uh, important development. Uh, it was also important in the, in appearance at least, the Global Compact seemed to establish a kind of consensus among states about the way in which refugee movements should be addressed in the future. Um, uh, and one can compare it with the Global Compact on Migration which proved to be a much more divisive um, process. There was generally a, a fairly unanimous global consensus around the global compact on refugees. And I think that has to be seen as a positive thing. At the same time, I would want to point out that there are a number of weaknesses and limitations of the global compact. Firstly, the fact that it's a non-binding document. It doesn't oblige anybody to do anything. Secondly, it doesn't include any specific targets or objectives. So, for example, it talks about the general need to expand resettlement programs, but it doesn't actually say to what extent they should be expanded, how many people should be resettled each year, and which countries should be doing the resettlement. So, no specific targets or objectives. Perhaps the most important limitation of the Global Compact, there are no real accountability mechanisms associated with it. So it was very easy for states to go to New York to sign up to the Global Compact um, to uh, kind of commit themselves to respecting its principles and then immediately to go away and act in a precisely opposite way. Uh, one of the previous speakers already referred to Australia and that would be a great example of a state that was very ready to sign the Global Compact but really had no intention of respecting some of the principles contained in it. A couple of other issues about the Global Compact. It said nothing really about IDPs, internally displaced people at all, despite the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that there are twice as many internally displaced people as there are refugees. And I think that was a, mixed op a missed opportunity. The whole IDP issue was entrusted to a so-called high-level UN panel which has come out with a report which I find to be very idealistic and not particularly realistic. The Global Compact, from my reading, is quite weak on protection issues. It says a lot about assistance and development aid and the kinds of relief that refugees should receive. It doesn't say very much at all about the right to seek asylum, about interception and detention, uh, or about the notion that repatriation should always take place in a completely voluntary and safe manner. In fact, the Global Compact says that repatriation can proceed without a political solution in countries of origin, which I think is a dangerous uh, element of the Compact. And then finally, I think that the Global Compact actually raised a lot of fairly unrealistic expectations. For, for example, UNHCR has described the Global Compact as a paradigm shift and I don't see anything in the Global Compact that represents a global uh, a paradigm shift. For me, it's very much kind of business as usual. And unfortunately, because UNHCR invested so much time, effort and energy and resources into the Global Compact, almost by definition, it has to declare that the Global Compact has been a great success. Whereas in fact, if we look around the world, I think it's fairly obvious that refugee protection standards around the world have actually deteriorated in the last two or three years since the Global Compact was introduced. Um, 
There was a very, very recently, the Danish Refugee Council undertook an evaluation of the Global Compact, and it came out with a very interesting conclusion, which was that the countries of the Global North really regard the Global Compact as something that's to be implemented in the Global South, and it's not to be uh, applied to their own refugee and asylum policies in the Global North. And I think that's a very astute observation. And uh, again, it's, I think it's a fundamental uh, weakness of the Global Compact, and it would lead to a perpetuation of a situation where countries of the Global North feel that they're doing their bit and are sharing responsibility for by paying for refugee assistance programs in the Global South without actually addressing the need to give asylum to uh, refugees making their way to those countries themselves. So all in all, I would say the Global Compact has some positive aspects, but as the basis for any kind of new regulatory framework, um, I would have some reservations. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff, um, for for your comment, especially on the global uh, compact. Uh, I think one of you uh, also uh, had a comment on the question of what to do with the regulatory framework, how to develop it further, hard or soft law. What's the way to? Do? Uh, I I I. <laughs> uh, it has been quite painful with the global compact. I must say, whether is it the global compact? or something that is, uh, I, I can say the regional one, which is the EU one, that in my in my presentation that I gave to you, uh, when was it last month, I managed to find uh, a quote where they are calling for uh, the return of, uh, of Syrian refugees. Uh, and this is the, this is the European compact. Uh, the Jordan compact is another story. I can refer to it like at the domestic level compact. So uh, on one hand, uh, uh, for example, in the Global Compact, I'm going to give an example, uh, it called for more empowerment for the refugees to be able to lead their own um, communities and to serve their own communities in a better way, rather than creating this burden uh, on the host countries, for example. Uh, by doing that, they created this, um, this very strange uh, engendered of disparity between what do you mean by this refugee-led organizations that you're calling for and you want to support and who can really create in the states something called refugee-led organizations without taking into consideration if the states do really recognize refugees at the first place to start with. Uh, so this is one major issue that has been called by the refugee compact that you would really stop you. And there is this emphasis that we are empowering refugees without taking into consideration the context. Let me take you to another lower level, the level of uh, the Jordan compact. Strangely, and I find it very strange because you are very much asking this question is what can we do with the, with the compact? When Jordan Compact was proposed in 2016, uh, that was coming out from the uh, Jordan, Jordan response plan, uh, the Syrian response plan, pardon me, that happened in the region, there was this momentum, high momentum from the international community to support Jordan uh, in and Lebanon as well in generating work opportunities for refugees. Funny enough, you would stop and you say the international community is very much supporting countries to serve one group of refugees. In Jordan, we have Iraqis, we have Yemenis, we have Libyans, we have Sudanese, and it's the international community that is very much calling for the equality and the human rights that's very much pushing for one group. So I'm really stepping a little bit back, a little bit back, and questioning: like, are we? What are we here being led by? A very rentier, a very rentier approach, very financial-led approach, where it is it is the international community that is very much choosing, uh, paying money, versing money to what serves their own interests. So that's why we're only supporting in the compact, uh, in the Jordan the compact, the domestic level, only, only one group. Uh, 
when the EU comes out and says, yes, indeed, we're calling for all these human rights, but please let, the, let these Syrians go away. We don't want them. Uh, so what's happening here? And at the other level, which here we come to the major question that I believe would really stand out so loudly in front of our eyes, I believe it is the state policies that whether we like it or not, they are the one that's detrimental in our issue. When Jordan says, when Lebanon says, I don't want to identify, I don't, I don't want to recognize this person as a refugee. When Turkey, that has given a signatory country of the 1951 convention, comes to you and says, all right, you're an Afghani, I'm gonna give you the, 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 the international protection card, but you know what, stand by, stand by. You have another 20 years to stand by until I find you a solution. So that tells us something, is that in my point of view, do we go for soft law or harsh law or hard law? There is something more important that I would call for. We don't want to fight each other at the end of the day. We want to be in peace. And that go, go, going for in peace, I would go for, let's go for a human rights based approach where we can secure the protection for those people, whatever they are, whatever of their nationality and race, in order to make sure that they can live equally with the others. There's nothing called, we don't want to be so dreamy. We don't have something called equality in the world, but at least to have their basic rights as per the Declaration of Human Rights. I'm gonna go really to the, the very much of the grounds of the human rights in order to make sure that these refugees have some rights. A little bit of uh, sad, uh, sad reality. So we are going to be more concrete in this direction very soon, but I just want to ask Mukhtar, Shirin, and Jay Marie if you want to add something to this question. Uh, I'll just say really fast that um, I think it's a massive mistake uh, that our state leaders think that they can separate refugee policy from foreign policy. They're connected, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mohtar, as I do not see you, uh, do you want to add something? Oh, I think he got lost. So perhaps he, I hope he's coming back. Okay, so then we move on to the next question. So, um, that's more about rhetorics now. So especially in countries of the globe, global north, refugees are often perceived as security threat. In the media, we even often hear about a hybrid warfare against refugees. Policies addressing forced migration are often designed based on this narrative and have become more and more restrictive in recent years, as you already described. So, how can we counter such narratives against refugees effectively? And how can we focus the attention back to the fact that refugees have rights and are merely seeking protection and have the right to do so according to international human rights treaties? So what Oru just said, I want to go more into depth with you now. So how can we change this narrative of the evil and dangerous refugee. I'm gonna continue. Yeah. Please, Oru. I'm gonna continue with something that I was saying, and um, I'm really sorry to give a sad example that we have every day been watching on Facebook. I'm not so sure how you are exposed to that. The Swedish example, what's happening? Uh, we're seeing every day these stories being posted, how the, the social, uh, the social, uh, what do we call it? The social, I'm not so sure what it is, but they keep saying, referring to it as the social, uh, that is uh, collecting kids, uh, kids of Syrians and Iraqis. Uh, and all these uh, refugees, uh, in my point of view, it, I set it in this. We often read about Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. We always taught our students about xenophobia. Mm -hmm. Today we're having, with me listening to the stories of what's happening in Sweden, uh, I'm not for the, sure Just for the about. audience, Oro, what are you referring to when you talk about Sweden? It seems, as I mentioned earlier, it seems there's a body called Social. Uh, uh, it's a body that, uh, that is collecting kids 
uh, ah, okay. Okay. kids from their parents, mm -hmm. uh, from their refugee parents, uh, and taking them away and giving them to Swedish families. Mm -hmm. And in my point of view, I situate this under the word of uh, cultural phobia. Uh, so I don't want me as Sweden, I don't want any more kids to be uh, nurtured by the very same Arab, Islamic, um, Middle Eastern uh, mentality. So let's take them away from their, their families and give them to, to our people. And here we come to you and the other, we and the other. We often talked about the other and the other always existed in, in the literature and the other always existed on the ground. We're not, we're not being so dreamy about this reality or romantic about this reality. But unfortunately in these last 10 years, the other has been so emphasized uh, the other has become the Muslim human being without even understanding who is behind this Muslim. He could be just a normal human being who believes in God. Uh, so you're a Muslim, you're a terrorist. Uh, the other has become this, uh, the, the Islamophobia that's very much has been emphasized. The hijab, you know, the, the wearing of the hijab, the wearing of the burqa. Uh, so all these very much of symbolism has very much shifted uh, into a very much of a social behavior very much embedded in the in the in the global north communities that's very much playing against uh, against the other that's coming with a different culture and um, it's uh, with very much of uh, restrictive policies against them very much of suppressing their freedom to just behave as uh, as uh, as equal as their peers who are the nationals of the host country so uh, so we'd question this, is that what's such a contradictive uh, voice uh, mm -hmm. the Global North is presenting to us? Mm -hmm. On one hand, we're calling for more human rights and pushing, paying lots of money for human rights agenda in the Global South, but at the same time, very much having this very restrictive attitude against the people on their own ground, taking them, taking away from them their identity. Like as if we're having this voice is that either you assimilate or I don't mm -hmm. accept you. You need to assimilate into my culture, my language, my religion, my, my shape, my, my hippo attitude even, even my hippo attitude. One of the guys in Sweden said it. He said like they once told us that we don't want these beliefs, uh, very much conservative beliefs that you are expressing in our country. We want more hippo people. <laughs> so it's, it's quite of an irony just to, to continue on our discussion. Anyhow. Very nice. Someone from the audience just put a link on the Q&A showing more information about the situation in Sweden you were talking about. I, I would just I would just very briefly like to add, I haven't like been aware, aware of the situation, but for reasons of context, I would just want to mention that the Swedish government denies this and says that these claims are disinformation claims that are being spread to cause distrust and uh, tensions in the society of Sweden. So we can, of course, now not verify or falsify this. Just for reasons of, of comprehensiveness, I wanted to, uh, to to let you know. But it does, of course, not, even if this was untrue, it does, of course, not take away from the points of uh, cultural phobia that you've mentioned. Um, Mokhtar, you raised your hand. Yeah, thank you. I'm not sure I get all, but uh, just to follow what Urubu was saying, if I understand it's about um, maybe a refugee phobia, I can say it like this, not only culture phobia. And uh, for me to share, I can say this uh, responsibility is, of, of course, the way uh, media threat, threats uh, the question is a uh, part, and there is even lack of uh, information from the media to understand mm -hmm. those people, how to treat uh, the information on uh, those people that are yeah. in seek of protection. I take the example of uh, always uh, those uh, refugees that bring up in Niger, most of them from Libya, most of them are Sudanese. So the population, the local population uh, at a certain time was skeptic, maybe I can say afraid of those people because they are, say, um, as they came from a uh, um, country where there is war, um, so they are afraid that, of that they will find 
there will be some combatant or some ex-combatant within them. And the local uh, area, Agade's uh, experienced already a rebellion during uh, 1980. So they are affected. So that bring, um, uh, I can say, a uh, refugee phobia from the mm -hmm. uh, local community to those people which are uh, sick of uh, uh, protection. But the reaction also of uh, the UNHCR and uh, I can say those, the, organiz the organism that in charge of them, the solution that they find, and it's always like that, is to build some center or camp uh, far from uh, the local uh, community. Like here, an example, in Agadez, always the refugee camp is at least 15 mm -hmm. or 18 kilometers from uh, the city. In Niamey, the, the capital, the um, camp of refugee is almost 30 or 35 kilometers from uh, the, the city. So I don't think this will uh, help to bring uh, understanding or to uh, find solution for this uh, such uh, uh, refugee uh, phobia, if I can call it. So this is the thing that I wanted to add on what I heard from the discussion. Thanks. That's a very, that's a very interest, uh, interesting and exciting aspect because that this is uh, what we also observe here in Europe. So all the refugee camps or accommodations, they are very, very isol in isolated zones, but so that they have problems to integrate into the whole society. Integrate. Exactly. Jay Marie, you also wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, uh, I wanted to add more examples on, uh, and first I agree with uh, Mokta, I would term this uh, refugee phobia as well, because it's not really uh, uh, the other that um, Uru was explaining, at times it's not, th that the otherness is not even there, but still there's that kind of phobia. And the example I can give is our case here. When you're talking about Burundians and people in Kigoma, these are one people. They're, they speak, uh, their language is more or less similar. They speak the same language. They have more or less cultural, um, uh, uh, their culture is sort of uh, uh, similar, but still the moment a Burundian comes as a refugee, there's always all these uh, perception of, of that he's a, uh, he's a criminal or he's mm -hmm. um, just a person who can kill you without no reason. But if he comes uh, as just a migrant, is okay. So you feel like um, the issue is this person being a refugee rather than this person being the other. Uh, and we also see that even in urban areas as well, when refugees, um, uh, whether documented or not documented, they will not want to. Can you hear me? Can yeah, you can, like you, can you lift up the microphone a little bit? Then we hear you clearer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah yes. So refugees wouldn't want to be uh, to to identify themselves as refugees because the moment they do so, then the discrimination begins. Congolese are people that we really love here in Dar es Salaam. We go to them as tailors. We go to their music. We love calling them Papa Congolese. But the moment the same Congolese says I'm a refugee, people start um, pointing fingers. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel, and that's why that goes back to the, my, my, the, 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 uh, the issue about the term refugee that I raised before, mm -hmm. because it feels like being a refugee is, 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 uh, bring, uh, comes with stigma that doesn't yeah. really help refugees. And uh, well, contributing to the general question, um, it, it, um, this protectionism, um, trying to keep others away, it's really scary, but that it's across the board. Uh, sometimes we give examples of, of, of what is happening in Europe or in, other, um, in, the, in the global north, but it also happens uh, in, in the global south as well, uh, maybe in different dimensions, but it happens. Everywhere, every country that hosts refugees uh, uh, tries as much as possible to put them away, like uh, marginalizing them. Uh, they don't want them to integrate. Very few would want to do that, that, do that, but many would marginalize them. The example Mokta was giving of the, of the camps being in remote areas, for those who have been in Tanzania, they can tell that you can drive several kilometers, the camp is in the middle of nowhere, there's no 
possibility of these people interacting with the with the the host community. So this is across the board. Absolutely. And now the the question is, is this is, is it a time? Is this a time when we should really try to understand what is behind this? Be it security, be it economic reasons, be it should we try to understand? Could this really be the reason? Or there is another reason that uh, is not really coming out clearly? Because um, even how can we change this? It's hard to tell because uh, everyone is doing it. There are those who want to build walls. There are those who want to pay other countries to host refugees on their behalf. There are those who would just for refugees that everyone mm. is doing it in their different ways so I, I think it's important to also invest in trying to understand what, what is really the reason mm -hmm. is it really security is it really economic issues is it really that cultural issues this is the other this is not the case in Tanzania so maybe this is the time that we should try it also to dwell deep bigger I mean dig deeper and understand that Yep, Thank you, Jeff Marie. Thank you. So the, I have Shireen wants to say something, and Jeff too. I please you uh, to to speak as short as possible. Shireen, you can start. Your mic. Uh, about the representation, I I do agree that there probably is some sort of refugee phobia. But I also think there is another narrative to it, which is refugee romanticization. Mm -hmm. So for me, I see two narratives. There's either the villain <clears throat> or there's the victimized right. that needs to be helped. Often, you know, it's presented in the image that is the woman and the child, or, you know, is the man who is coming to take your job, uh, you know? And, and none of them are true. None of them are true. Mm -hmm. When we talk about refugees, it's inherently about rights. We're literally just talking about uh, citizenship or rather the lack of a citizenship. So there's no need to create this persona. But this is very often what we do see in the media is how it is being presented. Um, with that said, it, <laughs> There is a lot of strange things happening in Scandinavia. <laughs> You're right about that. Also in Denmark, I mean, uh, yes. after the politi uh, one of the politicians in Denmark, she had added 50 uh, laws which were uh, reducing the rights of uh, asylum seekers and refugees, and she celebrated it with a cake. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, presented as something positive not as people actually losing out on protection and security and basic rights, which they uh, are more than entitled to, but that are now taken away from them in Denmark. Uh, one example of them is also like the jewelry law. I don't know if you've heard about that, but um, they haven't actually enforced it in practice, which is a good thing. I'm just gonna start with that disclaimer, but it, it did get um, put, like it, it was added, it did go through. Uh, and it, it implies that asylum seekers who come to Denmark need to pay for their stay as uh, refugees by giving away what they have of value to the state to cover the cost of the Danish state um, protectively. And this is part of the securitization that we see you know, being a refugee should be, um, um, it, it, it's protection, it's rights. It's, it's not something that should be used against you and least of all by the state that you're coming to seek protection from. Uh, so this is obviously something very serious going on here. And we also see this in the media, for example, in Norwegian media in 2015, when refugees started coming to Greece, they were quoted as such refugees. Uh, but now they're all just piled into this homogenous group of migrants. A refugee is a specific type of migrant, but mm -hmm. it also implies laws. It implies rights. Not every set of category within migrants does that. A, a migrant on its own does not is not necessarily representative of rights, but refugees are. So when I'm in Greece working, I'm a work migrant. 
that is the title that I fall under. That is the category. I'm Norwegian and I go abroad and I work abroad. So I'm a work migrant. So I'm a work migrant. Uh, so we, <laughs> we need to really address um, how the narratives are used and which terms are put into the picture because it does serve to reduce um, all the rights of refugees and particularly how politicians and media are using it. For me, as I see in Scandinavia, is very detrimental. Um, and also I just wanted to add one thing. So in the new migration pact, this is what came after the EU, um, after EU Turkey deal agreement from the European Stability Institution. Um, in that, there is one which is saying there, there is a specific part and it says in situations of crisis, member states are allowed to derogate from important safeguards which will subject more people to substandard asylum mm -hmm. procedures. I think this is really important to bring into light because the new migration pact is active now. This is what came after the EU-Turkey agreement and is saying that the, e that the EU member states can go away from the normal practice if, for mm -hmm. example, in case of a mass influx creating a uh, risk to the nation states. So then we can choose to protect ourselves first and uh, look the other way with the rights of uh, refugees coming or asylum seekers. Thank you, Shireen. Jeff, it's up to you. Please, as short as possible. Okay, quick word. Um, I mean, I think the refugee issue was always been controversial. I, I remember when I started working for an NGO in London in 1983, the UK was receiving 4,000 asylum seekers a year, which seems very, very small these days. But even then, it was a very controversial issue. What I've seen since that time, it's gone from being controversial to what I would describe as being a toxic issue. And it's a toxic issue for a number of different reasons. Firstly, uh, the association of refugees with terrorism and extremism. Uh, secondly, the notion that refugees somehow represent a threat to social stability. And thirdly, the idea that refugees have negative economic consequences mm -hmm. for the place to which they go to. So there's definitely a very toxic narrative around refugees that has developed in recent years. In terms of an alternative and more positive narrative, I can't really think of any other alternative than to say that you know the whole point of asylum, the institution of asylum, as it was developed after the Second World War, was to save lives and enable people to escape from situations where their life and liberty were at threat. And that has got to be the basic justification for the whole refugee system and the refugee regime. And of course, um, the very reason why the convention was introduced in 1951 was to avoid a repetition of events during the Holocaust when Jewish people were un unable to escape from Nazi-occupied Europe and to find safety elsewhere. So I think, you know, the fact that asylum saves lives, it enables people to establish new lives in situations where their lives are not at risk has to be the fundamental justification. At the same time, we have to recognize that there's a, a restriction uh, on that approach in the sense that only certain people can get out of their own country and seek asylum elsewhere. Jeff, and that's sorry. the offered poorest the most vulnerable people. Think about that. The refugee the refugee system, the refugee regime cannot solve the world's problems, but it can lead to a safe and dignified life for a relatively limited number of people who would otherwise be at severe risk if they remained within their own country. And just to add to that, I, I'm a little bit suspicious of attempts to change the narrative by talking about the positive economic impact that refugees have. I mean, I'm always, I always remember that, um, you may have seen that old UNHCR slogan, Einstein was a refugee, which gives you the impression that if you take in 100,000 refugees, you might be lucky enough to get one Einstein. I don't think that's a particularly convincing argument. I would say that we need to take people in 
because they deserve asylum on the basis of their protection needs, not because they can do some good to our economy. Thank you. Thank you so much. So there are more and more questions coming from the audience. So I want to speed a little up so that we can also hear what they are writing uh, or read what they are writing. So let's come to the work of the UNHCR briefly. So um, one central question of our series of lectures is how to hold accountable violations of the Refugees Convention. So how is the UNHCR cooperating with member states and why is the UNHCR often too quiet when it comes to scandalous treatments of refugees and forced migrants by states? Should the UNHCR be more independent from states in order to be able to raise more awareness about illegal and unacceptable treatments? What do you think about that? And is it realistic also to give the UNHCR a stronger mandate? So as a long-term expert of the UNHCR, Jeff, I hand over to you first. I'm actually a little bit reluctant to address this question. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I've worked for UNHCR for 25 years, more than 25 years. So I know the organization quite well. I think the expectations of UNHCR from people outside it are often a little bit exaggerated. We have to come to terms with the fact that UNHCR is a very state-centric organization. It was established by states, it's funded by states, its governing body, the executive committee, consists solely of states. It can only operate on the ground with the permission of states, and states, as we see in different countries, uh, are able to impose lots of restrictions on what UNHCR can do and what it can't do. So UNHCR is not a giant NGO. It's a very much part of the UN system um, and will always remain that way. So our expectations of it should be realistic. Um, uh, there have been some suggestions recently of establishing some kind of independent committee that would hold states to account for their actions in relation to refugees. Um, I'm not actually sure how that would work, whether governments, particularly UN member states, would actually allow such a committee to be established, how such a committee would function and what kind of difference it could make. I really think in terms of accountability, we have to look for structures outside of the UN system. We have to look at NGOs, at human rights agencies, at refugee-led organizations, faith-based communities, and the media to hold UNHCR and the states that contribute to UNHCR's work to hold them to account. So um, the idea of establishing a new body that would hold states, states accountable for me is a superficially attractive one, but uh, I think at the end of the day, it's civil society that can really hold UNHCR and states to account rather than any body established within the infrastructure of the United Nations system. Thank you. So this will be our next blog on NGOs, but Shireen and Mohtar, you, you said first and then Shireen. I, I just have a question to, no. to Jeff, actually. To yeah, do so, okay. Said. So he wants civil society to uh, do the things which we normally expect from UNACR? No. <laughs> or did I get that wrong? Like monitoring. Or so the civil society should monitor UNHCR uh, that they're doing the job that they should do with the state? Exactly, yeah. I mean, you know, UNHCR is a very important institution. It's the centerpiece of, centerpiece of the international refugee regime, and it ha has considerable influence because of the fact that it is widely endorsed by states and its role is recognized by states. At the same time, I don't think you can trust a large international UN agency such as UNHCR to be accountable to itself. And it really depends on actors from outside of the system to do that. And certainly since I've left UNHCR, that's what I've been trying to do in my own work. Mm -hmm. um, 
So for example, in UNHCR, I was head of evaluation, which had a specific responsibility for taking a critical look at UNHCR programs. But I can certainly say that you know, as, uh, as an independent uh, researcher and analyst outside of the UNHCR, I'm much more free to be critical now than I was as I than I was being a staff member of the organization. So yes, I really think it is dependent on actors outside of the UN system to hold the organization and to hold member states to account for what they're doing. And again, to use your, you know, the example of Australia, mm -hmm. which you mentioned earlier, I think, you know, the NGO community and refugee led organizations in Australia have done a fantastic job in holding the Australian government to account. Unfortunately, it hasn't led to any serious changes of policy, but at least it's on the record that Australia can't get away with doing what it would like to do without being held to account. Thank you. So uh, it would be Mohtar and Jane Marie for you both. In our one of our first sessions, we discussed the idea of a so-called refugee yeah. rights committee, what goes in the direction of the ideas of what Jeff just expressed. So um, what do you think about this kind of idea? Mm. Mohtar? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just maybe to answer direct for what you said that uh, or your question i think it will be a nice idea yeah but uh, i would like first to thank jeff on what he said right now upon um, unhcr and because for us or for me personally it's very important to understand even how it is because i am um, unhcr for us uh, it's sometimes more uh, blocked, like blocked on itself. It's even uh, difficult to get in touch with uh, uh, the workers to talk about and uh, exchange with them. This is a block of we as a civil society or NGOs. And um, I would like to bring one example. Sometime in... Um, 2019 on uh, June 21st, the International Day of a Refugee in the camp of uh, Hamdallah in Niger, uh, the refugee had a protest mm -hmm. to block even because there was uh, the government uh, members and the UNHCR uh, responsible there. So there was a big protest over there. No major uh, relate uh, the information, but as I was in touch with uh, many refugees, I had uh, the information. Uh, they give uh, me some um, photo and video, and I post something about it. Finally, then, um, about UN, I I've been called by UNHCR to ask me why I um, send uh, this information or why I publish this information. I said, okay, is that true or not? And they tell me that, oh yes, it's true, but you know, it's not from our uh, fault. We are trying to uh, find solution for them to resettle them, but it's not upon us because it's uh, depending on the other um, uh, states to agree. So uh, uh, it's not, we also, we are doing our best. So then I ask, uh, okay, if I publish this uh, information to, relate uh, globally that is not your fault, but the refugees are uh, protest protesting to find uh, their uh, rights. Do you, don't you think that I'm helping you also to have a uh, pressure on the other uh, states to help you or to open maybe their uh, uh, possibility or to give possibility to, to resettle them? But it become a kind of, uh, I don't know, political uh, discussion to this. So for that, I said, it's very complicated. Uh, I think it's important to understand even how uh, UNHCR and the other uh, states are uh, collaborating. And UNHCR also should uh, be open to the mm -hmm. civilian society and uh, NGOs to help uh, him or to help him, yes, to maybe to find solution for uh, the refugee and those in uh, asylum seekers. 
Yeah. Now that's that's what we also experience with the refugees in Libya. So that's a similar situation. And uh, Je Jeff, before you can respond to that, I would just uh, hear, listen to Jay Marie before. Yeah, uh, so um, most of what I wanted to say, Moka has already said. Ah, sorry, sorry, add... sorry, Jay Marie, sorry. I, I just wanted to tell the audience we are going to prolongate this session a little bit. So we are doing the session until 6.15. So only that you stay until the end and, dis uh, and discuss further with you, uh, with us. So we have uh, uh, half an hour left. Now, sorry, Jay Marie. <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to add to what uh, Jeff said that we should lower expectations on what UNHCR can do um, with all the limitations that she, he mentioned. I think it is also important for UNHCR to realize that they have those limitations and should be uh, open to cooperate and collaborate with other actors. Because there are times where uh, on the ground, um, it is expected that uh, it probably will be harder to deal with the government as a civil society than dealing with UNHCR, but sometimes it's the other way around. Engaging with UNHCR becomes very difficult, um, more difficult than engaging with the government. So um, uh, there's a feeling like um, there's a competition. UNHCR would remember civil society um, uh, only when things are very, very tough and they feel like there is no way through and maybe this, this is when they need collective um, efforts of other actors but when things are moving sort of smoothly then good terms with the government that's when they forget about other uh, uh players in the in the in the ecosystem uh they will only deal with the, the implementing partners because of course they are implementing what uh, uh they want to be implemented but operational partners sometimes it's hard uh so i just wanted to emphasize that part that it's 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 for us all to, re to recognize the limitations but it's also more, even more important for UNHCR to recognize that and understand that it's really difficult to do everything on their own. And uh, it's okay to have watchdogs. <laughs> because there's this notion that because they're the UN refugee agency, then it should be assumed that they have refugee uh, interests at heart and no one should question them uh, uh, about anything when it comes to refugees because uh, of that assumption, but no, that's not the reality. So just that. And and on the International uh, Refugee Rights Committee, I think it's 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 something. It's it's if if it can really happen in our real world, that will be great because it will provide um, another forum to discuss these issues. <laughs> Perhaps we should do an extra session just reflecting on how such a committee could look alike. So I wanted to discuss this here already, but I think we need another space and time for that. Um, so, uh, so is it okay, Shireen, if Jeff first answers? Because he, thank you, and then it's you. Thanks, yeah. Um... I mean, in my own experience, you, refugees have a very ambiguous relationship with UNHCR. On the one hand, they can be incredibly grateful and thankful for the services and the assistance that UNHCR provides. At the same time, they can feel very dependent on UNHCR and very hostile to UNHCR if they're unable to fulfill their aspirations. And you see that particularly in the context of resettlement. Um, in fact, there, you know, there are demonstration, refugee demonstrations going on at the moment in Libya, Tunisia and Indonesia. And the basic complaint of the refugees in those three locations is they want to be evacuated and resettled to safer countries. And they, they feel that UNHCR is not providing the resettlement places that they deserve. Now, of course, as we all know, UNHCR itself cannot provide resettlement places. It's only governments and states that can provide resettlement uh, places. But the way that UNHCR projects itself in the public domain is very much as if it's in complete control of everything and it can provide solutions for refugees. I, I always think it's very significant that um, the UNHCR Twitter handle is not at UNHCR, it's at refugees, which I think is a big mistake. UNHCR cannot represent refugees it can only represent itself as an institution but by doing so it gives the impression that it has solutions at hand and it can provide them to refugees and particularly in the case of resettlement we know that UNHCR can't do that 
it can only refer cases to governments uh, for acceptance. So going back to something that one of the previous speakers said, I think ex in terms of ex uh, managing expectations is something that UNHCR has not really thought through very thoroughly. And I think it needs to think through much more carefully about the way it projects itself to refugees and what it can and can't do for them. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So, Shireen. So, from how I understand UNHCR, uh, it's, it's there to protect the rights of uh, refugees. It's, it's there to make sure that refugees have access to the rights that they should have. So for me, I worked two years in Greece, in Lesbos. Uh, I was there in Moria, working there when it was at its biggest. There was over 20,000 people, even we don't know how many people there was. Uh, this is inside Greece, right? Inside EU. Um, UNHCR has consistently been there from since 2015. People are living in what I can best describe as state administered slum. People have access to water two to four hours a day, 20,000 people, infants, uh, old people, uh, um, handicapped, everyone. There's a constant struggle to cover basic necessities and UNHCR did not flag it. Personally, I'm deeply disappointed. At the very minimum, I'm, I'm sure UNHCR can attribute and, and produce solutions to it, um, but they did not even flag that there was an issue. So my question is then, okay, we as organizations, we, we can, obviously we can flag it, we can criticize it all we want, but we also need, uh, you know, the, the, the provided actors to do their job, to, to fulfill their end of their task. And, and this was very often used against us when we criticized us, uh, Christ, these conditions. We were also told that then um, UNHCR would have said something or they would have been more involved or they would have you know, made something bigger out of it. And because they didn't, it almost turned into an ambulance effect that had the opposite uh, result for the people mm -hmm. uh, because they, they were, they should have done more. They should have said more. They should have flagged it and they didn't do. Uh, and it only served to hurt the very beneficiaries that they proclaim they're there to protect. So that's my take on it. That's my experience. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. <laughs> Now I think we share the same frustrations. Therefore, we put also this into question here in this session because I think we all ex um, expect more. So thank you, Jeff, also for framing it again. Yeah. So so what is really possible on the side of the UNHCR? So let's come now to the question um, of how we, as civil society and also as NGOs can create a stronger and more effective global voice to highlight refugees' rights. So um, my, my question is, uh, during this series of lecture, I, I think it was one of the best experiences I ever had to have this regular exchange of information and experiences between academics and NGO activists. So when we then imagine to have also refugee-led organization, so I perhaps it's it's a it's a dream or a naive utopia, but I I can imagine that we could create a global network that could also have influence and raise uh, raise uh, their voices for refugees' rights, so that we come back to this approach um, that uh, to to strengthen refugees' rights. So therefore, my the the this is the last round of discussion I would like to do with you. So how can we they have a better network globally and how can we be, be, be stronger together? So I think this is not the first time that someone asks you this question and I think you also discussed it with various actors. So what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I, I can go first. Uh... Yeah. Do so, Jamie. Then Uru. Yeah. 
So first, I, I think uh, it, it, um, the idea of having this global movement is it's a very good uh, idea. But um, I think we should start with movement within mm -hmm. the countries, uh, then within the specific countries, because, um, and I'm talking from uh, where I am, I'm talking from where we have very weak civil society uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to issues of refugees. So um, we have been, for example, here, we have a network uh, that is like just the network is un in registration. There is nothing that the network, like nothing, nothing significant that the network is doing. So if we're able to first become strong uh, um, locally, mm -hmm. that's when we can then come strong uh, at re regionally and also uh, globally. So I think the first step is to um, um, sort of uh, whether the empower is the correct term, but uh, ensure that we have a strong civil society movement within the countries where uh, refugee protection is actually happening, and then it can just go step further and further up to the global movement. So that's mm -hmm. our Uru? Thank you. Um... Similar to what Jane Mary has just said, uh, when I'm thinking of the Middle East, um, I, I feel that we really need, before thinking about the action and the role, I would just, first of all, highlight the background, the context. Do we really have states that do give the, the space for NGOs to exist, civil society bodies to act, mm -hmm. uh, RLOs to have a presence or a voice. Um, and mm -hmm. it's ironic, uh, we were talking about it a few days ago in one of, of our talks, a country like Lebanon, for example, that's so known with its very vibrant, dynamic civil society bodies does not have that space and mm -hmm. the right for our laws, refugee uh, civil society bodies to exist. And this is a country that does create a space for the civil society bodies, but does not identify or recognize the presence of the, of the bodies that are created by refugees. Um, in a country like Jordan, the history of Jordan never, they never had something in Jordan called grassroots. Uh, and there is this top uh, top-down approach that has very been very much dominant in a country like Jordan I think applies to Turkey by the way so the the more the stronger the state is authoritarian wise or police wise the less space is out there one for the civil society bodies to act and if they did exist we need to take into consideration it's a very much of a top-down approach. And secondly, very, very little space, even tinier space is being is made available for refugees to, to maneuver, exactly what Jane Mary has said, to maneuver and to prove a voice that they have. And uh, the research that we're doing is proving to us everyone is working underground and uh, they're mostly initiatives rather than very much putting this mm -hmm. Very big emphasis, augmented emphasis on the word uh, refugee-led organizations. Um, so this is this is a very important element just to take into consideration. And uh, absolutely you're right. You're absolutely right. I just want to for your further reflection, and I, I wish also to hear the others. So just for just for your information, so in the anti-torture movement, for example, there is an international uh, a global movement. A global global coalition with member centers in every continent and every region of the world. And so what you were explaining both, so that the local movements have to be strengthened at the local networks. And if you are in an atmosphere of political repression against NGOs or human rights defenders, then the IRCT, this is this um, anti-torture coalition, shows that uh, this movement can give the necessary solidarity also when you can't have um, situations of risk or danger of members in countries with political repression. So this is just for you for further reflection. So it could work. Uh, it's difficult, but it could work. So um, Jeff, what, did you want to say something? 
Uh, very briefly, I mean, yeah. as we as our time is running out, let's think a little bit about the future. Mm -hmm. um, two of the concepts that have become very prominent in the whole refugee discourse recently is firstly, since the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016, yeah. the whole notion of localization. And then since the Global Refugee Forum in 2019, the notion of refugee led organizations. And I think one of the most interesting things to watch in the months and years to come is the extent to which localization really takes place and the extent to which refugee led organizations are really incorporated in a meaningful way in, in planning and implementation and evaluation of programs. Um, and I'm sorry to sound skeptical again, but my suspicion is that the, the big international humanitarian agencies, both within the UN, but also in the NGO sector, are probably not going to be that willing to give up the resources and the power that they have under the current dispensation. Uh, because imp yeah. imp implementing localization in a meaningful way and giving some kind of role, meaningful role to refugee led organizations does actually mean a, a redistribution of power and resources. And I think the one thing that we've mm -hmm. learned about the humanitarian sector is that the big organizations that dominate it are quite keen to retain the power and resources that they actually have and maybe less than willing to give it away or will only give it in a way in ways that actually enable them to retain control. So uh, I'd be interested to hear what Jane Marie, for example, has to say on this. I, I suspect something that may well happen in the, in the months and years to come is that refugee led organizations become incorporated in the formal structures of the international refugee regime and whether those organizations remain genuinely representative of refugees on the ground is something that we might need to think a little bit about. And another question which I, I've never been able to resolve in my own mind is how do you ensure that a refugee-led organization is actually representative of the refugees that mm -hmm. it purports to speak on behalf of? Um, in any society, people who have power, resources, influence tend to rise to the top and take control of institutions. Uh, is that going to happen in the, con in the, in the context of refugee-led organisations? Are we going to end up with a kind of a refugee elite who lead such organisations who are closely connected to the structures of the international refugee regime, but who don't necessarily represent the kind of people who are protesting on the streets of Tripoli or Tunis or uh, Jakarta at the moment? Thank you. Shireen? Yeah, I completely uh, second what Jeff just said now. And that's exactly what we saw as well. Um, when the first um, refugee-led organizations that came in Moria in Lesbos uh, was in 2020. And at that time, it was vastly dominated by NGOs. Mm -hmm. NGOs were taking, calling all the shots on behalf of people not actually what people wanted, but on behalf of them, what they thought were good for them. Um, so when the refugee organizations really manifested and, and started doing things for themselves, the first reaction from the other NGOs was like, really, they can do that? Like, that's kind of, you know, <laughs> where we set the bar, that people were, uh, a lot of the international organizations were surprised that refugees could do things that for themselves. Um, when in, in reality, from what we saw it, it was a lack of access to resources. All they needed were the resources, the ideas, the solutions, that uh, experience was already there. Um, obviously now only speaking for Lesbos, just to emphasize that. But when they then started doing things, um, there was a complete shift of power dynamic happening and so many actors were resisting it. Uh, even yeah. dirty tricks. <laughs> wow, that's that's a frustrating aspect, <laughs> and uh, which yeah. is, which is a contradiction because these mm -hmm. this this is coming from the actors who are saying that they are there to help this very same people. Uh, so it's a contradiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I completely second that, and also just to add, um, there is a 
big difference to how NGOs were operating 20, 30 years ago to how they're operating now. A lot of them, not all of them, some of them are very good, talented, and definitely doing uh, everything they promise to do to the beneficiaries and whatnot. But a lot of them, from what I've seen, are operating like big powerhouses. And it's a very scary sector to go into because it's mm -hmm. unregulated. And it's uh, a lack of accountability because it's constantly shielded by this uh, promise of goodwill and good intent. So it's hard to crack down on. And up to this day, we still haven't seen um, a proper um what should i say disciplinary action towards organizations who have overstepped of ngo misconduct we haven't seen it there is a lack of accountability so while ngos can be helpful we also need to hold them accountable to when they do overstep and to the misconduct and not constantly uh keep giving them power and, and resources yeah, this is a this is an aspect I also wanted to discuss more with you. Unfortunately, we do not have the time right now, uh, as you're really coming to an end, and we also want to give you the chance to make a final statement. Um, just very shortly, um, I just wanted to, yeah. Um, well, my, the intention of my question was to have something positive at the end. <laughs> So that didn't work. <laughs> but I still hope that the context we made during this series of lectures so that we at least could create a network and stay in touch and perhaps find good ways how to strengthen refugees' rights. But thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Shireen, for this critical aspect because we'll have to keep them in mind. And um, yeah, the NGO scene is... Yeah, to help them accountable is an interesting point of for discussion, I think. So thank you for that. Um, so, Benedict, yeah. to you. Huh? Thank you very much, Bianca. And I completely share your desire for some positive outlook um, at the end <laughs> of the session. So um, with all the food for thought that we have gotten now, with all the topics we touched against the background of all of this, uh, we would like to make one final round, um, asking you for very brief statements on what, where you see the international refugee system in 10 years from now, and what are your hopes or perhaps your fears, but given that we, this is uh, the last chance for a positive outlook, perhaps... Okay. We should go back to um, uh, remember why did we have the refugee um, 1951 convention to begin with? Why refugee? Why are we talking about refugee protection? If we go back to that and then incorporate with all these new concepts that are coming in, uh, whole society approach, human rights approach, uh, localization and everything else, but doing with that um, initial, uh, uh, initial uh, goal uh, uh, um, of, of protecting people who are in need of protection, then we can go uh, the positive way. The GPR, all its limitations that Jeff has mentioned, that I agree with, uh, can still take us uh, there if we really uh, realize and, and uh, we really acknowledge the, 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 the limitations or the weaknesses that it comes with and iron them along the way. So that's one way. But if we don't want to go back to uh, the basics, why refugees, why are we talking about refugee protection? It can really go the other way, totally the other way. And I don't want to imagine that. Thanks. Thank you, Jane Marie. Who wants next? Mofta, we didn't hear your voice for quite a while. Yeah. Um, okay, just to 
maybe sum up was um, Jeff asked how are we seeing uh, this refugee uh, protection system it's going for the next 10 years I, for my uh, point of view uh, Jen, uh, Mary just said it can go uh, two ways but in, in the way that it's uh, going now in 10 years it will be a chaos just to be <laughs> yeah I always want to be an uh, optimist but uh, it's uh, real because uh, if you look at what is going on uh, it's just I look at my uh, area 10 years back maybe we don't talk we didn't talk about a uh, refugee, but now, right now, today, it's uh, more than a uh, hundred thousand or million. And if you look at uh, what is going on, the wars, uh, mm -hmm. massive production of weapons, climate change, people, people are <laughs> continue polluting uh, the environment. So, of course, the amount of people which is uh, will, which will be in need in next 10 years will be right. greater. And uh, so I usually I'm an optimist, but uh, in this way, I think it will be very the chaos. But just to come back to uh, what's been said, I think a global movement will be a good uh, thing that uh, we can have uh, all the perspective from NGOs and others, uh, government and uh, all, uh, I can say actors together to find solution will be a good thing. But by doing that, we have to take in consideration what we've said just to like uh, the organization that lead a refugee matter like UNRC or to be more uh, transparent to the NGOs to be more open or to open more his gate to the civilian society because what we say, we all uh, want the same thing, humanitarian and help to uh, give those in need uh, protection. But in, uh, to, to conclude, I will say in, with uh, such uh, global movement also, we should pay attention to not uh, be together because I think civilian society should be a counter power of uh, those who have the yeah. Yeah. so that's it of course because of already the, um, the it with NGOs and NGOs are more a lot of NGOs talk about uh, refugees. They have never been in touch with people. You understand? Uh, to, uh, uh, to choose who are really in contact ground. That, uh, we should not forget that uh, they are human beings. Been so we should not be always talking uh, about them and for them yeah, to that's give true. them a, a space for them yes. also to yes. say something yes. on your on their yes. willing. Nice, thank you. That's what I wanted. Thanks. I thank think you. That's uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we've we've reached uh, the end of our of our webinar, but uh, perhaps uh, I think we can all agree that Mokta, what you just said, is a very very uh, good statement to end on, a very good postulate um, to conclude our discussion with. Um, also in the, in the name of, of the Institute uh, for International Law of Peace and Armed Conflict, I would really like to thank everyone uh, who participated in this panel today. Uh, thank everyone who participated in the discussion series. I think uh, we all uh, learned a lot, got great perspectives, a lot of food for thought. Um, to think about um, the future of the uh, Geneva Refugee Convention. Um, thank you also to the participants and uh, sorry that our tight uh, program today did not allow uh, a lot of interaction uh, with the audience. We hope that you nevertheless um, had a great time uh, and an inspiring time listening to, to, to our great discussion today. Um, and you can find all other um, all other recording or the recordings of all other sessions on the YouTube channel of our Institute. And we very much also encourage you to keep the discussion going in the comment section uh, to these videos.
Thank you, Benedict. Uh, so even though we are at the end, so I just, uh, sorry, but I have to give the others also the, the possibility to say something at the end. So therefore, Urup and Shirin, um, please, you have your, your last words for this session, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very much enjoyed the discussion. Um, uh, just finishing really with a positive note, but I, I like, um, I'm going to repeat something I already mentioned. It is really worth um, having, uh, calling or advocating for a human rights-based approach when we are very much talking to countries, host countries, when we are talking to an SCR, when we are talking to the international community and uh, remind them of the word equality. Really, yeah. they might be really need this reminder. The second thing is, uh, uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned, Jeff also mentioned that at the very beginning, it is really worth calling for uh, a revised uh, uh, protection approach. Uh, so yeah. not really widening the definition, rather coming back to the definition, coming back to the wordings, make sure that new refugees, we did have new refugees, are being taken into considerations, new conflicts. Uh, I was thinking, in fact, when you were talking, I was thinking of those people from ISIL, how what, how do we treat uh, how do we treat them? Uh, they are displaced, but also under very awkward torture. How do we situate them? Uh, so uh, new, new revision is worth calling for a revised approach, uh, protection approach, because this is the way we can ensure the well-being of us as many possible of people uh, who are stranded uh, between the lows that are very not clear, the policies that are very restrictive, and the international community with the funding that's very limited. Um, and thank you again. Because I think he also did not give any final statement yet. Uh, yeah, I also saw there was a question for me. So um, the way that I see the situation in 10 years is that it's just going to be more and more IDPs. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very realistic. People who are uh, refugees, but uh, don't get to go in under the international protection as a refugee because they cannot cross the border. So they're refugees within their own country. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think this is where uh, we're headed towards. And as much as we want that civil society should be the answer to um, this problem, which is systemic, then it's very much so embedded into the politics. Uh, and um, I'm sorry, but Joe Biden is not calling for my advice. So um, I'm going to forward that uh, responsibility to the state leaders to come up with a solution because they were also the ones who implemented a practice of IDP uh, in the 1990s. So if we need to revert it and we need to come up with a solution, not we, I'm sorry, our leaders need to come up with a solution which is is um, realistic and working in practice and not just keeping people detained uh, with a lack of uh, response, lack of opportunities for years. Thank you so much, Irene. So, Jeff, up to you. So, Jeff, up to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I mean, looking, looking forward to the next 10 years, at the formal level, I don't think anything much is going to change. We'll still have UNHCR, we'll still have the Refugee Convention, we'll still have the Global Compact on Refugees. I think the question is to what extent those institutions and those processes actually remain relevant to refugees themselves. And to try and end on a positive note, the thing I find inspiring is that despite all of the difficulties with which they're confronted, refugees forge their own strategies and their own coping mechanisms. You know, I very much uh, remember during the 1980s and 1990s, a lot of host governments in the global south insisted that refugees should remain in camps. The refugees themselves simply ignored that and moved to urban areas where there were better opportunities. At the moment in Europe, you have uh, they think they should go where they have friends or relatives or mm. where they can make the best future. So what I find inspiring is the fact that refugees have their own strategies and often it's the big organizations like UNHCR, 
who are really kind of struggling to catch up with what refugees are doing themselves. Um, so I don't think the institutions will change a great deal, but I think um, refugees will continue to pursue their own strategies and try and find more peaceful and productive lives wherever they can. So nice, Jeff, because I wanted to raise the attention of everybody to a campaign that is going on globally, and it, it is led by refugees, saying, follow the Geneva Refugee Convention, only that, that's what we want. And um, I think this is a nice frame uh, and a nice ending for this session that we all stand here and tell the audience and tell the world follow the GRC, follow the Refugees Convention. I thank all of you again, and I really hope that we stay in touch. I think, uh, and I wish every success and every luck for your work and every solidarity. And yes, so it was an absolute pleasure to do this with you. Thank you so much and have a nice evening now. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Hello, bye-bye.